In this edition of Jerusalem Dateline, an explosive ruling from the International Criminal Court calling for the arrest of Benjamin Netanyahu and Yoav Gallant, and new evidence emerges of collaboration between UNRWA and Palestinian terror groups going back years. Plus, an ancient seed germinates, giving a living expression to what may produce the Balm of Gilead. All this and more coming up on this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Hello and welcome to this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Chris Mitchell. The International Criminal Court has issued arrest warrants for Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, his former defense minister, and Hamas officials. The warrants turned Netanyahu and Yoav Gallant into internationally wanted suspects. Here's the latest. The warrants accused Netanyahu and Gallant of war crimes and crimes against humanity over the war in Gaza and Hamas for the October 7th attacks that triggered Israel's offensive. The ICC decision would put Netanyahu and Gallant at risk of arrest if they traveled to certain countries. Back in May, when the ICC threatened arrest warrants, Netanyahu called it a moral outrage of historic proportions. The warrants come as Israel fights wars on its southern border with Hamas and Hezbollah in Lebanon. On Wednesday, U.S. negotiator Amos Hochstein concluded talks with Lebanon's Speaker of the Parliament. If we made progress, I would go to Israel and make those uh, additional discussions there based on the conversations here and see what we can do. A major sticking point is Hezbollah's demand that Israel can't respond to violations by the terror group. It is not allowed for Israel to violate and kill and enter whenever it wants. Israel's new foreign minister says they must have that right. We will need to keep the freedom of, uh, to act if there will be violations. Sa'ar says Israel must be able to keep Hezbollah from ever again becoming a huge threat. We will have to enforce that they won't be able to build again their force in Lebanon. They won't be able uh, to bring again uh, ammunition, missiles, while Hochstein would not discuss details of the agreement, Middle East analyst Lee Smith tells CBN News it would underwrite the Lebanese army that's been infiltrated by Hezbollah. We're talking about an additional $400 million for the Lebanese armed forces in addition to the hundreds of millions that we have uh, now decided to give them yearly. What we're doing is we're paying a Hezbollah asset. Smith says the deal favors Hezbollah. It not only protects an Iranian proxy, the chief Iranian proxy, Hezbollah, what it also does is it also uh, it stiffs the American taxpayer. We call it funding for Lebanon. It's not funding for Lebanon. It's funding for Hezbollah. At the U.N. Wednesday, the U.S. vetoed a Security Council resolution demanding an immediate, unconditional and permanent ceasefire in Gaza. We made clear throughout negotiations we could not support an unconditional ceasefire that failed to release the hostages. Israel points out Hamas can easily end the war. If Hamas were to release the hostages and surrender their weapons, not one more shot would need to be fired. In the U.S. Senate, an effort by progressives to end sales of offensive weapons to Israel went down to a solid defeat. Opponents said it would send the wrong signal. This signal will be seen by the enemies of Israel and the enemies of peace is if they just stick with it, they will win. Prime Minister Netanyahu swiftly defended Israel's actions in Gaza. No war is more just than the war that Israel has been waging in Gaza after Hamas attacked us unprovoked. Israeli President Isaac Herzog wrote the decision has turned universal justice into a universal laughingstock. The ICC charges Netanyahu and Gallant are guilty of the war crime of starvation as a method of warfare and the crimes against humanity of murder, persecution, and other inhumane acts. We are accused of deliberately harming civilians while we are doing everything to prevent harm to civilians. We are accused of starving a population while we are bringing hundreds of thousands of tons of food to feed the population. The ICC's charges came amid evidence of another international organization's bias against Israel. A new report from the group UN Watch said a former United Nations Relief and Works Agency Commissioner General held a secret meeting in 2017 with terrorist groups including Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad. There, the UNRWA chief reportedly told them, we are one and no one can separate us. 
As for the ICC warrants, they mean Netanyahu or Gallant could be arrested if they go to certain countries accepting the court's authority. Nations such as Ireland and the Netherlands agreed right away to do it if given the chance. And to those countries, Netanyahu won't be able to travel, and that's a very, very big thing. Netanyahu's hoping for a tough backlash against the court. This decision will have severe consequences for the ICC and those who cooperate with its decision. President-elect Trump's soon-to-be national security advisor, Congressman Mike Waltz, promises you can expect a strong response to the anti-Semitic bias of the ICC and UN come January. House Foreign Affairs Committee Chairman Michael McCall and Republican Senator Lindsey Graham want Senate Leader Chuck Schumer to bring up a bill for a vote that the House has already passed. The measure, called the Illegitimate Court Counteraction Act, Senate Bill 224, would impose sanctions on ICC employees or associates who aid this effort to prosecute Israeli leaders. Graham tweeted, the court is a dangerous joke. It's now time for the Senate to act and sanction this irresponsible body. Paul Strand, CBN News, Jerusalem. Coming up, IDF reservist Daron Kadar reports from the front in Lebanon. With the war in Gaza winding down, the majority of Israel's defensive resources have gone into Lebanon. A friend of ours, Sergeant Major Daron Kadar, has been there for months and stopped by our studio this week. Here's our conversation. Daron Kadar, great to be with you here in the studio. We've talked to you over this course of this war. You just came out of Lebanon. Can you describe what it's like inside there with boots on the ground? Well, Lebanon is much more trickier than Gaza, that much I can tell you. Um, the enemy there is way more advanced in their training, in their weaponry. Um, they, they are very crafty, uh, just like the Hamas in Gaza. They play dirty, they use the terrain, their home turf to their advantage. They use similar tactics of underground tunnels, underground tunnel systems that are completely under whole villages in southern uh, Lebanon that uh, essentially make the battle space, again, very tricky as a, as a warfighter because you don't have a bunker or a, uh, a military installation that you're, that you're going after. You're actually going through villages uh, and pastoral uh, um, uh, nature reserves. And so it's slow, methodical, and uh, at the same time, very successful. We have gotten a lot of uh, success in uh, finding the, the weapons caches, uh, the uh, rocket launching uh, uh, systems, which are in houses. A lot of them are just out of a home where the home just opens up the, the roof, uh, kind of you know retracts, and out of a home you have rockets flying into Israel, and that's how they essentially get away with uh, firing from civilian areas that aren't identifiable very easily. Mm. They've also been talking about a lot of Russian weapons uh, in, uh, in southern Lebanon. Is that what you saw as well? Plenty, plenty. That's exactly it. Uh, uh, Russian weapons, better weapons than they had in Gaza, uh, nicer, uh, more well-kept, uh, newer uh, AKs and uh, um, uh, machine guns, etc. Yeah, you're right. I mean, that's exactly it. They're using some of the most advanced Russian weaponry in this warfare against us. And of course, that leads to the question, of course, how did they get their hands on that? Mm, yeah. Uh, you've been there on the ground. Do you see uh, an end goal? Do you see the fact that you can take over up to the Leitani River? 100%. I think um, we are committed, at least the soldiers are. The soldiers are committed, the, the, the generals are committed, many of which have advised the uh, government, um, the, the defense uh, um, um, administration that we need to get to the Litani so that we, and, and for the viewers to understand what that means, the Litani is a, a geographical border between Lebanon and Israel. It helps give us through the terrain, it helps give us a defensible border, whereas for right now, which I've spent many years since 2006 uh, up until let's say 2015-ish, uh, on the Lebanese border patrolling it and many of the times you find yourself in a disadvantage where the enemy can basically strike you which is what led to the second Lebanon war when our soldiers were vulnerable and got attacked and got kidnapped and so on. So if you get to the Latani that's a more defensible border for Israel. In contrast to what we're used to 100 yeah. percent it is a game changer. 
Despite the negotiations efforts in Lebanon this week by U.S. mediator Amos Hochstein, peace and security along the northern border seem far off. Middle East analyst Lee Smith explains some of the factors that make it so. Lee Smith, great to be with you. Uh, tell us what's your feelings about the talk right now of a ceasefire with Lebanon between Hezbollah and Israel? Um, uh, well, thank you, Chris, and great to see you and great to be with you. Um, look, I, I think it's up to uh, obviously the government of Israel to make its decisions about its uh, about its security. This is this is not good for the United States, though. When you talk about the Lebanese army, are they corrupted in some way with uh, Hezbollah influence, and uh, are they uh, are they an honest broker in this uh, in this scenario? No. No, not at all. And it's perverse to hear American officials talk about this uh, as, as though the Lebanese armed forces operates on its own. It's entirely run by Hezbollah, as are the uh, as are Lebanon's internal security forces. And again, the United States taxpayer is on the hook for paying for assets for for Iranian proxies. So right now, uh, right now, American policymakers need to get a little more serious about what's happening in Lebanon. And right now, the idea that the Lebanese armed forces and UNIFIL are capable of uh, going to the south and preventing Hezbollah from causing any more mayhem, not, not, just, not just in the north of Israel. And unfortunately, we have to recognize some unpleasant facts about the Lebanese political system. And that is it's lots of people, not just Hezbollah, not just the Shia community, are profiting from Hezbollah's control, including large parts of the Christian community as well, who are allied with Hezbollah. So we have to deal with that unpleasant fact. Again, as a fighting force, it's much depleted, but as a political force inside of Lebanon, nothing has changed. Well, do you see any hope of uh, you know Lebanon being free from Hezbollah and its uh, sponsor, Iran? Well, the question is how much Lebanon how much Lebanon wants to be free, right? I, I, again, it's it's very it, it's very sad and unfortunate. Um, but I think that both for uh, for us as Americans and for the Israelis, we have to ask our own questions about our own national interests. We have to keep in mind there are some uh, some Christian groups and some Muslim groups who are aligned with American interests, and there are others who are not. And as Americans, uh, as 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 part of our our our, our great uh, our great American nation, we have a whole bunch of people who are living here, and we should not see the world, especially not our national interest, in terms of uh, sectarian interest. We have national interests that advance all Americans, not just particular groups, neither Muslims nor Christians nor Jews. Well, Lee Smith, appreciate your perspective and analysis on very very uh, important subject right now here in the Middle East. Thank you so much, Chris. Still ahead, turning the page, looking at a possible replacement for the UN Relief and Works Agency. Since October 7th, the world has come to see UNRWA in a new light, with its direct collaboration with terror groups like Hamas and Islamic Jihad. It raises the question, if UNRWA were to be dismantled entirely, who would do the work? The site at this bomb shelter has been called a massacre within a massacre. That day on October 7th, Hamas terrorists murdered 16 Israelis hiding in this bomb shelter after fleeing the Nova Music Festival. They also kidnapped several, including Israeli-American Hirsch Goldberg Poland. In addition to being with Hamas, the man leading that part of the massacre had another job. Muhammad Abu Itiwi was a Nukba commander in the El Burej Battalion of Hamas's Central Camps Brigade. He has also been employed by UNRWA since July 2022. You have uh, employees of UNRWA who were leading the massacre. A report from Amikai Chikali, Minister of Diaspora Affairs and Immigration, documents those employees who took part in the October 7th massacre. He tells CBN News Hamas's infiltration of the agency has been widespread. The entire system, because Hamas is in power, so if you want to be an UNRWA employee with a very nice salary, you must be related to Hamas. So UNRWA employees in Gaza were mainly all Hamas militants, all Hamas civil organizations, uh, personnel, all the families of Hamas militant and members. 
if you're not connected to Hamas directly or indirectly, you cannot walk in UNRWA in Gaza. Evidence of this relationship is why the Knesset recently overwhelmingly passed a law that Israel divorced itself from UNRWA. You have to understand again the spirit of the bill. We have nothing against uh, uh, international community against foreigners, against the idea of humanitarian aid. This is what Israel is providing. It's about the fact that UNRWA participated in the massacre of the 7th of October. After the vote, UNRWA claimed the law would be disastrous. Today, millions of Palestinian refugees fear that the public services on which their lives depend will soon disappear. They fear that their children will be deprived of education that illnesses will go untreated and that social support will stop. 17,000 UNRWA personnel in the occupied Palestinian territory fear that they will lose their employment. The entire population of Gaza fears that their only remaining lifeline will be cut. Legislation co-author Boaz Bismuth disputes those claims. There will not be a vacuum. It's not because, I mean, they were helping yesterday. Someone else cannot do the job tomorrow. The job will be done. Because I will ask you the same thing in Gaza. You can tell me, you know, Hamas is reigning in Gaza. I mean, you kick them away, so all control. Someone else. It's as easy as that. And it will be found. Other people can do it and will do it and will do it beautifully without being terrorists. Chickalee's report cites how UNRWA has perpetuated Palestinian refugees for generations. The fact that we have an entity solely for Palestinian refugees that can inherit this status to their kids, grandchildren and grand-grandchildren, creating more and more refugees every year. And then you have the rest of the world, UNHCR, a refugees entity that is for any other refugees in Africa or Asia, or uh, Ahiti, it doesn't matter. His report contrasts UNRWA and the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, or UNHCR. Overseeing 5.9 million refugees, UNRWA employed 30,000 workers in 2023. That same year, UNHCR employed 18,000 while overseeing 59 million refugees worldwide. Chickaly says the difference goes even deeper. Because the UNHCR is not an ideological entity related with the war against the state of Israel. And UNRWA is part of a war. It's a war. It's a war machine. It was designated to train the Palestinian younger generation for jihad. That is the reality. And also when you go physically and you go and you see in schools of UNRWA, in so many cases, beneath the schools you have tunnels. Within the schools you have ammunition and missiles and weapons. It's why many in Israel want UNRWA abolished and support UNHCR to take its place. But in a statement, UNHCR tells CBN News, as we with other UN agencies have previously warned, UNRWA is the only entity with the capacity to deliver the scale and breadth of assistance that 2.2 million people in Gaza and millions of other Palestinians in the West Bank, Lebanon, Syria and Jordan need. As the UN Secretary General has stated, there is no alternative to UNRWA. Yet critics cite that UNRWA's most lasting and infamous legacy is its education system. Many principals of UNRWA schools in Gaza were also Hamas members. Chikali says it takes a village to raise a terrorist and that UNRWA helped teach a genocidal ideology. This is the Palestinian ideology. This is UNRWA ideology. And by the way, it's also very, very important to understand the jihadist ideology, to train the kids to hate, anti-Semitism, to teach them that the war against the Jews and killing the Jews, that is the most important thing on earth. And this is also a part of what we saw on October 7. Under the Biden administration in 2023, the U.S. became UNRWA's largest donor. In Donald Trump's first administration, he ended the agency's funding. Most here hope when he takes office in January that he acts quickly to do so again. Up next, a tree grows from an ancient seed. Could it produce what's known in the Bible as the Balm of Gilead? 
A thousand-year-old seed germinated in recent years could be the producer of the biblical balm of Gilead, known for its healing qualities. CBN Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl went to the desert for a closer look at the tree and to meet those caring for it. Deep in the Negev desert, experts growing the tree see it as a miracle because they thought it had disappeared from Israel a long time ago. When they planted the thousand-year-old seed 14 years ago, they had no idea what it would become. Now this nine-foot tree could be calling to us from the times of the Bible. This is a miracle. It's a, a resurrection. Dr. Sarah Salone of the Natural Medicine Research Center leads the Sheba Project. A pediatrician by profession, she became interested in traditional uses for plants for food, medicine, spices, and dyes. Salone and Dr. Elaine Soloway, head of the Center for Sustainable Agriculture, started the Middle East Medicinal Plant Project here on Kibbutz Keturah. I got very interested not only in the plants that grow here now, but the plants that grew here a long time ago, especially plants that are mentioned in the Bible. That led Salone to begin a search that would ultimately lead to this tree they've nicknamed Sheba. It's a tree that was grown from an ancient seed, a thousand-year-old seed that was found in the Judean desert about 40 years ago by Professor Joseph Patrich, professor of archaeology at the Hebrew University, when he was excavating caves about five kilometers west of Jericho. After years of in-depth scientific and biblical research and consultations with experts around the world, they believe this tree is prominent in the Bible. In the book of Genesis, which dates to about at least the story of Jacob and his sons to about 1800 BCE, we find reference to something called sorry, tsori, and it's a resin from a tree or a bush. Salon says tsori, translated as balm, is often mentioned in connection with something of value here. Something of the land, this land, the land of Israel, and something connected with healing, especially when it's talked about by Jeremiah and later by Ezekiel. Salone gave the seed to Salome so she could take the next steps in growing it. An odd seed. I had never seen a seed like it before. Um, uh, someone said to me, it's an olive. So I said, no, that's not an olive. And someone else said, it's an apricot. So I said, no, it's not an apricot. So. I planted it. Soloway carefully watered it and treated it as she does with other ancient projects. Much to my astonishment, up came this funny little shoot with a hat on it. And when the little green shoot emerged, we didn't know what that was either. So I sent pictures all the way around the world. And one of the botanists who I sent it to wrote back and said, You've grown a Comifora species. Comifora is Latin for a plant family known as a giver of resin, a sticky substance that can be used to make medicine. And it's part of the family of trees, bushes, in which myrrh and frankincense belong. Some of the most famous incense trees in history belong to this family, but not all members of it are fragrant. Leading experts, however, had no knowledge of this specific one. There didn't seem to be anything that was quite like this tree. So eventually, when we started to test its resin, and I found out that there was something very strange about it. The tree is now 14 years old, and Soloway says they still don't know much about it, other than she believes it's special. It could be an extinct tree, it could be the sorry, and we're going to plant it. I feel that it has come back to us from a long time. Salone and Soloway have worked together for almost 20 years. They began with planting 2,000-year-old date palm seeds. CBN News met Soloway in 2011 when the first one, Methuselah, was very young. It, along with other Judean date palms, are growing well, and this is Methuselah today. Referring to their new tree, the possible producer of the balm of Gilead, they believe there's a positive message for today. That there is healing in the world. We just have to find it. It's a dark time. And in this dark time, it's a kind of resurrection in a way. It's something that hasn't been seen for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. I think uh, to me it represents light and hope. 
Julie Stahl, CBN News, Kibbutz Keturah, Israel. What a great story about an ancient seed giving a modern window into the Bible times. Well, that's all for this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Thanks for joining us. Remember, you can follow us on social media, and you can also access CBN content through our CBN News and other CBN apps. And don't forget to sign up for our email blast so you can continue to receive information on breaking news. And please keep praying for Israel, for the peace of Jerusalem, for the IDF soldiers and all those caught in harm's way, and for the hostages in Gaza to come home. I'm Chris Mitchell. For all of us here at the Jerusalem Bureau, we'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline.